There we go. We are back. I hope you all have full tummies and have enjoyed some beautiful soup and sandwiches and whatnot. If you would love to come a little bit further down, um, just because church is family and we can sit close together if we want to, regardless of what kind of sandwiches you had at lunch. Well, you guys are doing okay. We were just saying, if you guys want to come forward, just be a little bit cozier, you know? It's all good. Also, this front woman has got heaters and <laughs> yeah. Closer you are to the front, the closer you are to the radiators. You want to get some heat? Move back. Okay. Um, this is just going to say I'm going to invite the worship band up and then you can... Yeah. Okay, we're going to have some more time of worship. Um, so I'm going to invite the band up. Uh, and we're going to give them a little brief introduction and some questions as well, because it's not fair that they get away with all of that after you guys have answered stuff. So, go for it. Lewis, do you want this one just now? You can add on. I have this one. Oh, it is on. Um, could you tell everyone your name? Hello, my name's Lewis. Hello. Hey, Lewis. Thank you. And can you tell us what you do with your day job? So... Day to day, I um, work at the moment with a retail company called Sainsbury's. I'm one of the managers there, um, but I'm in a transition period of moving out of retail and into, um, so I'm going to be a music development coordinator for Aberdeen Performing Arts. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit where your uh, passion for worship came from? So my passion for worship kind of came from a few different places. Um, I think... What I probably want to focus on is actually the fact that, you know, what worship in its act is, 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 is like prayer as well. When we sing, we're actually singing prayers. You look at all the Psalms and it's, these are all, uh, like we read through it and you could actually pray this stuff. And it is, it's like when we're sing, singing, we're singing prayers, we're declaring God's truths. And I think my passion kind of came, my most recent kind of, surge to that passion kind of came when it, when worship became real for me. I think um, I went through a little bit of a hard time a couple of years ago and felt like I couldn't, I couldn't go any lower. And at that point, all I could do was lift my hands up in worship and praise God. And actually, um, because I know he's got his truths, uh, his, his Bible is truth. Everything he says is truth. And actually sitting in my room, it's, it was easier for me to pick up the guitar and sing something that was from the heart um, than it was to kind of sit in silence. So that's probably where that came from. That's brilliant. Mm. Can't get any better than authentic worship. <laughs> um, could we maybe just give them a round of applause for battering on and we'll let you get to it. stand whilst uh, Lewis gets his guitar. So I feel like um, we've, so you've kind of got to know me a little bit. Um, I thought it would be good to kind of just introduce the rest of the guys. So we're all from Aberdeen, um, from different churches across Aberdeen. So we've got Charlotte here from City Church. Hello. There's Rory here from West Hill Community Church. And the loud one behind me is Sam, and he's from, he's from Shed Exley as well. So um, we're going to just carry on with some worship and actually just kind of declare, keep declaring God's truths. And actually, um, you know, this next song is about, is about taking us to that river where we get, river of overflowing blessings. So this is called Take Us to the River. Take us there in unity to sing a song of your salvation To win this generation for our King A song of your forgiveness For it is with grace that river flows Take us to the river in the city of our God Take us to your throne room 
Give us ears to hear the cry of hell For that cry is mercy Mercy to the fallen sons of man For mercy has triumphed Triumphed over judgment by the blood Take us to the throne room In the city of our God For the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us This is the year of the Lord Yes, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us Lift us in the shadow of your hands Is this your mighty angel Who stands astride the ocean and the land For in his hand your mercy Showers on a dry and barren place Take us to the mountain In the city of our God Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us. This is the year of the Lord. For the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us. This is the Because they're in unity to sing a song of your salvation To win this generation for our King A song of your forgiveness For it is with grace that river flows Take us to the river in the city of our God is the lion on and the lamb, the lion over everything else, and no one can stop him. I sing, he's coming on the clouds, he's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break. His broken hearts declare His praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah He's roaring in power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chain, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb, and every knee will bow before Him. Sing, open up the gates. Open up the gates, make way before the King. God, it comes to say, as He set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. 
Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb And every knee will bow before Him Who can stop the Lord Almighty? And 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 who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. You can stop the Lord. Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. And fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sin of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before The Lion and the Lamb And every knee will bow before Him Yeah, Lord, we declare that today. We declare that there is no one who can stop you. Yeah, Lord, as we serve you, as we, as we meet you, as we seek you, Lord, we know that your word says you will build your church. And Lord, we trust you for that. We trust you that no powers of hell or anything can stop anything that you're trying to do. We know that because that's what your word says. Yeah. Hmm. So we thank you for the truth of the song. It says you are the lion, the lion of Judah, roaring with power. This is 
Yes, I will fall at your feet And I will worship you Yeah, Lord, we thank you that worship is so much more than a song. So much more than just getting to worship you with music. But Lord, worship is our lives. And Lord, I thank you that, yeah, that we can, we can worship you wherever we are. In prayer, together in unity. And Lord, I pray that you would just, yeah, help us to go to deeper levels in worship, Lord, with you in our own private space, Father. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we're going to invite Sam Donahue. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> this. I'm going to give you this. Um, so this is Sam. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, and Sam's going to talk to us about Tribe. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I don't think they quite realise what they've done by giving me a mic. Yeah, so, uh, I don't want to speak very long. <laughs> I was right to say. Um, and then, I want to pray mostly, because you can't have a day of prayer without praying, can you? Um, so, you'll be wondering what tribe is uh, and I'll give you the story of it uh, but basically tribe exists to uh, take part in what God's doing amongst students by engaging them in authentic discipleship and mission by actually getting them to the heart of what it's all about which is intimacy and prayer with God so it's about gathering students from across universities colleges churches in Glasgow primarily at the moment to seek God together and individually for that intimacy and that prayer room in the heart that we're all meant to carry. So, where it all started was um, probably uh, in, in a small way about seven, eight years ago um, where I saw God do some things and it was like I saw him do things, like I did stuff and I saw him do things. Um, but actually, I was like, what's the point in doing things if we're not praying? I was like, because I, and actually I want to honour someone who's here. So James Faddis, it was actually in James Faddis' church in Fife. And it was seeing a heart of prayer that him and his wife had that really brought me to it. So I want to honour you in the start of all the passion for prayer and stuff. Um, so it probably started then as a 16, 17 year old. And then about three years ago down south, um, I was at this festival called Momentum. Um, and I turned up to this one seminar because I couldn't get to any other seminars because I was doing a stall. I turned up to this seminar and there was this very charismaniacal American preacher who's like every, all, t all the time is ministry time. And, uh, and he pointed, pointed up the back and he's like, you man. God's all over you, man. And I was like, well, I don't know about it. Like, <laughs> it's news to me. But I went, <laughs> I went forward anyway. And, um, and I got prayed for. And literally this moment has changed my life. God showed me Charing Cross in Glasgow, uh, where the city centre and motorway meet. And uh, as far as the eye could see, north, south, east and west, uh, it was covered in a dark smog and there was a black flag in the middle of Charing Cross. But then almost like I was viewing it as if I was a drone and then turning up toward Bath Street was this army of people walking down Bath Street and they were covered in this gold atmosphere. 
And wherever they walked, the streets turned to gold, pavements, buildings, the people they would walk by would turn to gold. And floating above them was the most ornate, regal throne I'd ever seen. Like that, My imagination couldn't mimic what I saw that day. And then on the throne was the most grotesque picture of a, a slaughtered lamb I've ever seen. And standing at the front was someone with a red flag. Now that sounds really conceptual and metaphorical, right? But I knew exactly what that meant. I had this deep sense within me exactly what that meant, that God was birthing out of Glasgow a, an army of people who prayed on the go, who loved the mission of God, who loved to get involved in the mission of God, but they started and they carried, they carried um, a, a prayer room in their heart. And that, it was, it's like, some people might call them missional intercessors, but it's just prayer warriors on the go. And uh, from that moment on, alongside like people like Crystal from 24-7 and others, I started to explore what this could mean. And then uh, in this 24-7 prayer room that I helped set up with a good friend, Rachel, um, God told me this started with students. And I was like, no, it doesn't. I'm a student. I'm chaotic as it is. And I know there's worse than me. I am not working with students. It's not happening. And um, <laughs> two years on. Um, so then over the summer, I was praying about it. It was like, but it just became so clear that God was saying, this army of prayer warriors on the go starts with students. And I was like, okay. So me and my friend Barnaby decided to open up someone else's <laughs> flat um, to gather people to pray. So our friend Kirsty had a huge um, living room. And we expected eight people to turn up. Those eight people didn't turn up. But 27 other people did. And we were like, 27 students turn up to pray? Like, you don't get that in a church. Like, for two hours, we actually couldn't get people out. Um, and there was a newborn baby living next door. And we're like, shut up and out, <laughs> move. So we ran a second one, 27 people turned up. But 14 different people turned up this time. And again, it was a different flat because we weren't allowed to use that flat because we created too much noise. The third time, 33 people turned up, 16 hadn't been to the two before. So at this point, we're reaching 50 to 55 students to pray for two hours at a time. Uh, so then by the Christmas, we were like, what are we doing? Like, there's something here. And God gave me this picture of a tomato plant. And um, <laughs> I'll often get weird pictures, but it was a tomato plant that actually for it to grow it needed structure. So for the soil to be steady enough, it needs a pot. And for the tomatoes to grow upright, it needs the stick, it needs structure. So for all that, I'm like, I really want, I don't want this to become an organized, controlled thing that is so hard to move. Like I want it to be fluid and, and movement and actually it goes with where God's going and we're always at the back of him. We're always following him about and doing what he's doing. But God was like, there has to be some kind of structure. So we gave it a name, tribe. And the reason tribe is because, well, there's 12 tribes of Israel, the picture of the kingdom of God. And actually, students as a tribe are just make up part of the nation of God, the kingdom of God. And so actually, it's about gathering us together um, to actually start a new way of living, to show a new way of living, um, which starts with intimacy and prayer and leads into following Jesus and engaging with the mission of God. <clears throat> so... We've been gathering once a month in St. George's Tron in Buchanan Street in Glasgow. <clears throat> and they've been excellent, giving us the place for free. Um, students love free things, which <laughs> is excellent. Um, and we've gathered now about 130 students across 12 or 13 prayer gatherings in uh, Glasgow. An average of about 27 to 30 students each time coming to pray. And the one thing that marks our prayer gatherings is there is no sung worship. And it's not because we don't like sung worship, but it's because I was so convicted by God for a season not to do any sung worship. Because it's as if one arm of the church is sung worship and the other arm of the church is prayer. And it's like we've worked this arm so well that we can lift like 100 kilos, but this arm's only doing 20. And so actually like... We even found that people find it hard to pray without there being any 
music or sung worship and you're like, well, actually the best thing to do is almost just to put it to one side and be like, no, let's just pray without any kind of stuff around it. Let's just pray. So that's what we do. But our vision's much greater than that. Our vision's actually <clears throat> to see two sides of things. Creating spaces for students to pray across the spectrum of universities, colleges, churches. Um, but also to, out of that, <clears throat> find the students who have what is known as the Anna calling. And Anna and Luke too is the woman who comes out to meet Jesus as the baby. And she's been praying and worshipping in the temple for decades of her life. Around 60, 70 years of her life. And actually, it's about finding those students who have that call in their life, because I really believe, as I'm one of them, whose call is to be, the call in the kingdom of God is to be those who, who are prayer warriors 24-7. That's what they do. But they have this pull to engage with what God's doing. So they support and they encourage the mission of God from the prayer, the literal prayer room, but out of the prayer room that is then cultivated in their heart, go and engage in the mission and justice movement of God. So uh, in September, hopefully we're looking to launch what we're calling a tribe prayer base, which is a community of about 12 to 16 students um, who will commit to a rhythm of prayer and community. Um, still be based in a local church um, who will create spaces for students to pray, who will resource students and churches and prayer that leads to authentic discipleship and mission. And we'll part, we, we want to partner with churches, ministries, and um, others who have a passion for revival and reformation among students. So that's tribe. Hopefully I didn't go on too much. But uh, there's three things I want us to pray about. <clears throat> so the day that God spoke to me and said, it's student Sam. I was walking down um, Dumbarton Road in Partick. And uh, I was nearly crying because <laughs> I'm like, not students. Um, but God spoke really clearly to me and was like, no, you need to go for it. And he spoke really clearly to me through week 15 in the prodigal son. And he, he, he was breaking my heart for apathetic Christian students and for students who were Christians in their teenage years, but they moved on to uni and college and just just didn't have the maturity or the support to, to actually thrive in that environment. And uh, he was speaking to me through Luke 15 about the lost son, the parable of the lost son. And I looked up and here was an old friend uh, who I now know is like just living the party life, with drugs and drink and used to be a Christian. And he didn't even recognize me. And God says, it's these I want you to go after first. And I could, have, <laughs> I could have cried in the middle of the Barton Road in Partick, like, and I just kept walking. And, uh, and so actually, what I feel like God is doing is he's wanting to revive Christian students first to be the witness. And the kind of Christian student I think he's after is this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about half a liter of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it out on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So a few years ago in Geneva, at the 24-7 European gathering, um, an annoyingly intelligent and wise German man called Johannes Hartl stood up and ruined my life <clears throat> by giving a talk that's been entitled Beautiful Waste. And now he says here that actually, like, perfume, no one needs perfume. It's a waste to spend 40, 50 pounds on perfume. No one needs to smell like that. But we do it 
because it adds it adds lovely beauty and and flavor to life. So he says here actually Mary is wasting. She's wasting that before Jesus, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful waste because it's offered to, to the most high God. And I was like, that's the way I want to live my life. Like a beautiful waste. Like a life that just sits at the feet of Jesus, learning from Jesus and pouring out my best. Giving my best. And I think that's the kind of student, the kind of person that, that God is longing after in these days. And I find that really difficult. And the reason I read right up to the Judas Iscariot bit is because I think we all are Judas. We don't tamper with money, but we take what should be for the glory of God to, to, go off, to grow our ego. We do activities and we do stuff and we engage with the mission of God so that we feel good about ourselves. And that, so then we don't need to feel the pain and the hurt of being human. Because stopping and being with Jesus and looking in his eyes of perfection, we're faced with our imperfection. We're faced with what he's wanting to do in us. So, I want us to, in twos or threes, <clears throat> gather together and to pray for a generation of people who are like Mary, who stop, who do not care about the things that God cares almost disingenuously, but who, who just wants to pour out their best before God as an act of worship and praise before him. Um, and we're going to do it what I would call tribe style. So every time we gather to pray, we split up into twos or threes. And I make sure it's people that the, that, are the, that the others don't know. So go and find two or three other people that you do not know or you know very little. You don't know them very well. And then pray with them for a generation of people who would love God like Mary of Bethany. So get up and find someone you don't know. Let's get to it. And because we're a small number, I suppose I might let you like one person that you know. I'm also available to be prayed with. <laughs> Who wants to pray with me? Oh, you all know me. Get away. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I slept on my couch last night. Move. <laughs> Well, Moira, are you looking for a group? Sit in the back and work. I hardly know you, Sam. I want to keep it that way. So yeah, just get praying for this for a generation of people to be like Mary of Beth. They even get it. It's John 12, 1 to 3 or 4, if you want to use that as inspo.
Amen. Sweet. Okay. I think I've only got five minutes left. Which is, or maybe even two. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Really quickly then. Um, I was going to do two other bits, but let's just put them together. So the first thing was, um, like I said, I feel like what God's doing and has been doing for about 20 years is actually this thing of creating the ministry for people who have this deep thing in them that's like, actually, I'm, I'm not called necessarily to be a preacher or to lead or to teach, but actually, I'm just called to pray and to help others to pray and to engage with what God's doing in the earth from that. And I really, I really think that actually, in our Scottish context, we, we just don't get that. There's no space for it. And so actually, trying to introduce that into... A younger generation is quite hard because there's no frame of reference for it. But I really think they're, and I've met them, and I know them, even if they don't know them, know that, that they are them. I know them, and I see them in Glasgow. There is this cohort of people who are ready. You just, they just need that. They need that thing. So I really want you to pray that actually those people, oh, my laces have come undone, that those people who um, have that call on their life, We'll have those around them and we'll have the attentiveness to the spirit to act, to go for it. Um, second, um, all of this is just to see revival and reformation break out in uni campuses and colleges. Like, it's just what I long for. I sat outside a coffee shop one day. I mean, I don't cry, but God made me cry a lot over this and I hate it. <laughs> I'm from Glasgow, I don't cry. But... It makes me cry. So I was sitting outside a coffee shop outside uni accommodation and I literally sore inside for about f a week because God just showed me something of the brokenness that lived inside each of us. As, I'm not a student anymore, but as students at the time. And I was just like, oh man, we need you. And I feel it every day. And I'm like, come and just restore. Just, just restore and renew so those are the two things, calling of people to be like Anna in Luke 2, who pray night and day, and second of all, revival and reformation. And uh, if I've got time, I'll just chuck in. If we are what, uh, like, I really think God's got a big thing for tribe to do. It's his thing, so I'm just trying to follow him. Um, but we literally have no money 
and we have very little resource and uh, we're wanting to uh, expand into Aberdeen, Dundee and Edinburgh in the next year and there's wee beginnings in Aberdeen and Edinburgh but nothing in Dundee. So people, there's a whole thing of calling, like get people, like pray for the calling to be discovered in people but also just like all the practical things for us, money, places, people, etc. Um, can I give just a couple minutes for people to pray, Pete? Is that all right? Is that all right, Kirsty? Kirsty <laughs> nodded when I said Pete. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> right, just in your twos and threes, the calling on people's lives to be like Anna, revival and reformation, and all the practical stuff for us. Thank you. Yeah, Jesus, thank you that you are providing disciples in the most unlikely situations. We just pray for the city of Glasgow, for the colleges, the universities, those of us that are blessed to be students there, um, and may tribe expand. Amen. We're hearing some incredible stories today, some incredible ways that God is moving in our nation. Um, and one of the things that I'm really excited to hear about, actually, because I don't know much about it, is James Faddis's, I can't, oh, you're there. I was going to say, where have you gone? Uh, is James's stuff. So please come and join me up here. Not at all. James, would you like to just give us a quick introduction of who you are, what you're up to, and I'll give that over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, really missing Des. Just spare a wee thought for the man himself with his feet elevated eating grapes, probably watching us in live. Uh, so bless you, Des, we're praying for you. And uh, So my name's James Faddis. I'm the pastor at Bishop Briggs Community Church in Glasgow. And uh, a little bit about my background was really encapsulated as I drove uh, across the bridge and came into this area. Uh, I, I said to someone, kind of jokingly, that I was born here. I wasn't, I was born in Cowinan in Ayrshire and grew up in Irvine. 
but I was born again in uh, a wee town called Long Forgan, just along the road there, um, in the Queen's open estate, Castle Huntley, uh, when I was 17 years of age. And that was through the witness of prison chaplains and students from the city of Dundee and senior citizens within the churches that maybe felt that they didn't have much to give, who stepped out and came into the jail to share the simple gospel. It wasn't complicated. I was by no means, none of us were academics. They said, Jesus loves you. God loves you. He's got an awesome plan for your life. He died on the cross for all your sins. And if you have faith and you believe in him, you'll be saved. And they prayed for us. And I gave my life to Jesus that night in Castle Huntley uh, at the end of a, about a year in prison. Um, I'm now 45 and I'm the pastor at Bishop Briggs Community Church. And I felt the fire of God on me. Um, my, my whole, I felt like my whole car was shaking as I just drove along that road, past Long Forgan, into Dundee. There's fire of God on the city of Dundee. I'm hearing what's going on in this city. I'm hearing what's happening between churches. And I really believe that God has got more. I felt the fire of God. God reminded me of the fire that touched me then. That fire continues to burn. It's not like something new, but God's saying, there's a time for this fire to blow up now. It's time for it to expand and to grow. And just as we've been praying for students, for student, and, and even hearing about uh, Alpha and prisons and thinking about all that's going on in the city, uh, I feel that God's, that there's be, just been so much of this has been converging as I, I came here today. So I'm, re I'm here representing a, a movement called The Turning. We've got a couple of slides. There's, there's not much up there, but what is The Turning? Um, well, a couple of years ago, I heard about a pastor in Reading, the Gate Church, a wee Baptist church in Reading, and they had invited an evangelist to come and do some equipping with the congregation for a, a, a week-long mission. And they'd prepared maybe about 10 folks in their congregation to do follow-up. Uh, to train them, to make sure they got a Bible and got some study and they could follow them up. They went out on the street and over a period of two weeks, what, what was meant to be a week extend, extended to two weeks, in a period of two weeks, they saw over 1,200 people on the streets of Reading respond to the simple gospel. Uh, the kind of academics would talk maybe about the kerygma gospel, the simple proclaimed gospel, not apologetics, not argument, not even signs and wonders and power evangelism, the simple gospel. God loves you, has an awesome plan for your life. All of us have sinned, but... And the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God's eternal life. And whosoever believes in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you want to receive Jesus? And people were praying in their hundreds, in their hundreds. They had no capacity to follow up. So immediately a unity movement had to come about. Churches from all around the city were saying, can you take 200 people and follow them up? Can you take 100 people and follow them up? And that, that ministry continued, became known as a turning, and it was really identified as an evangelistic outpouring of God. A move of heaven, responding to the prayers, churches and church leaders who had been praying together for over a decade. And God poured out his spirit, and there was such a receptivity from the lost on the streets of that city that they were just saying, yeah, I would love to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. When we heard about this, a team of, a group of pastors and leaders, particularly uh, senior pastors in, in churches who were leading movements like uh, the Baptist Union of Scotland, uh, the Apostolic Church, AOG, Destiny, uh, some of the more uh, ethnic-based churches like the Redeemed Christian Church of God and the network that I'm part of, the Scottish Network Church, he said, let's, let's invite Yinka Oyekin, who, who started his journey in Wester Hills Baptist Church, let's invite him to come up and share with us. And so we launched the turning uh, in, in, in Scotland last year. If you look at the next slide, uh, we basically went to three cities at the end of August and we spent eight days in each of these three cities. Um, and that meant that it looked like setting up hubs of church leaders and their congregations to pray together, to spend time encountering God, worshiping, blessing, interceding, and then going out the next day on the streets for one hour, having been equipped to share the basic simple gospel. You talk about you don't need a three-year degree to share the gospel. Most of us are well-educated beyond obedience. We know more than most people in our country. And we went out in the streets for one hour and over a period of eight days in Scotland, next slide's got it up there, we saw over 850 people respond to the gospel in three cities. Do you know what our problem is now? We're not equipped to disciple people. 
our churches don't know what to do. So we pass, here's 12 new people who prayed in the streets, can you follow them up? And, and, and folks don't know what to do. So we've, we've provided discipleship resources and we're following them up. A couple of stories. I was on the phone yesterday to a young man in Springburn. We went out in Springburn on Saturday and saw over 20 people respond to the gospel. And 17 of them were, were put into an app that we've got so that they could be followed up. And I phoned up a guy and I said, I, I, I'd love to meet up with you, take you out for a coffee. I heard you prayed. We'll give you a Bible. Just want to encourage you. And uh, his story is that he was a student at Regent's Theological College. He led a homeless ministry and a youth life group and he's totally backslidden into heroin. But we connected with him in the streets and I'm meeting up with him next week for a coffee to bless him and encourage him and pray for him to see the prodigals return. Another lady in my church, we said to her, could you follow up this person here in Porso who gave her life to Jesus? The, she went with another person, chapped her door, and the, she was delighted to meet with them. And so they've got a, a Bible for her. They're meeting up to follow up. We're, we're connecting with people who are a million miles away from our churches. So if our churches are here and some of the activities that we do in our churches are here, um, where we're connecting and the turning is a way over here. And the, the aim is to to get ordinary believers sharing the simple gospel and discipling and following up those that respond to walk with them to the point where they're coming closer to the life of our church. One final uh, wee testimony, uh, Catherine, one of the other ladies in our church, she was asked to follow up a lady who didn't pray the sinner's prayer on the street but said she would like more information and, and she's just completed her Alpha course at Tron Church and City Centre. So Catherine went with her to that. I don't know if she's a believer yet. I don't know if she's a believer, she, but she, she has now been well enough versed in Scripture that she knows what's going on. So uh, the next slide. So this month, later on this month, we're going to be back in Dundee uh, at half past nine, meeting with leaders from different churches across the city to envision them, share with them. Yinka and myself will be traveling around Dundee, East Kilbride, Ayrshire, Paisley and Falkirk because these are five additional regions and cities where we sense that there's, there's a call to go there and, uh, and just, see, see, we're not a parachurch ministry. There's something about this that's really important to know. So I'm not employed by the turning. I'm, I'm a local pastor. Everybody that's part of it, they're members, ordinary believers in local churches and pastors. We're just saying, can we, can we have a faceless and a nameless revival because the body of Christ doesn't need an outside organization to do anything for her because this is our calling and we have to stand together and we have to reach out with the gospel and we have to disciple those who respond. It's the Great Commission, folks. It's Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations and that's what we want to be about. So hopefully in, in these uh, five areas and also in Inverness, we'll be launching another six hubs uh, in addition to the three hubs that have been launched in Glasgow, Aberdeen, and Edinburgh. We just go out for a, a, an hour once a month together and we lead people to Jesus and then we've got the hard work of following them up. So I want to encourage you in just a wee moment we'll, we'll turn to prayer for that. But I've got a testimony from a, a friend, a, a pastor from, from over in, in the Edinburgh area. Well, not really Edinburgh, but in the central belt. So um, some of you might know Malcolm Round. We're just going to play this a minute and a half and then we'll turn to prayer. Hi, my name is Malcolm Round, and I'm the minister of St. Mungo's Church on the outskirts of uh, Edinburgh, and I minister in Belerno and Livingston. I just want to just say how the turning has absolutely revolutionized me as a church leader. Firstly, it got me back to actually doing direct street work evangelism. I've always done it, but I kind of stopped for the last 30 years. And then going out on the streets again, seeing people become Christians actually in front of me was astounding. So firstly, it has rejuvenated and re-energized me in my evangelistic endeavor. Secondly, it also humbled me because I've become an expert and I know what doesn't work. And I know that street work no longer is effective. I am convinced about it until I went out on the street and saw people 
in a very simple presentation of the gospel, give their lives genuinely to Christ to make a personal response. And the third thing that has changed for me is what it's done to my church. What it has done is given members of my church real confidence in sharing the gospel. Many of them have never seen anybody ever become a Christian before in front of them. And suddenly, in an hour on the street, to actually watch people make a response to a presentation that's so simple, that's so easy. And so the congregation have become enthusiastic and have got a fresh passion for sharing the gospel. So I highly recommend the turning to you. So uh, we're just going to take some time to pray. I think what Sam established there, just preaching in groups of two or three, uh, would be ideal. Uh, the first thing that we want is to pray for is for church unity. Um, it's not just like unity that, that, that reduces everything to the lowest common denominator, but a unity around about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the unity of the Holy Spirit. And um, we often say the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And we have a deep fellowship, a deep koinonia in the gospel and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for unity. Uh, I read one of my predecessors at my church is the late David Black, and the, the, the last, one of the, the last messages that he gave uh, was, was really speaking about this, this unity move of churches across the nation, standing together in prayer and going out into our streets and our local communities and our cities and mission. So let's pray for unity. Pray for unity for our churches, particularly in this coming year as we go out with the good news of Jesus. Just do that for five minutes and then we'll, we'll come back.
So, yeah, Lord, we do pray for unity in our churches. We pray for you to help us and work with us to mend the nets across our churches through uh, the different denominations and networks and streams and uh, organizations that, that, are, that are doing so much, Lord God. We celebrate that, and I thank you for the diversity, but we pray for unity, Lord. We pray that congregations and particularly pastors and leaders, Lord, we, we believe that they're very, very important. We pray that they would be able to stand together under the one banner of Christ, not, not under the banner of a ministry, not under the banner of a, of a ministry with a, with a desire to, to grow itself, but under Christ the Lord, Christ the one Lord. And may we be one church with one faith, one hope, one, one baptism, one Holy Spirit and one mission, Lord, to just to fulfill and answer the prayer of Jesus for unity. We pray that in our nation. Pray that you would help us to make every effort to maintain the unity of the, the Spirit through the bond of peace, Lord God. Help us to step into that, to take that seriously, to be voracious about it, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, one of the things, that, what Sam shared about students uh, really chimed with me. I remember as a young person who had come into the church and we began to meet as young people from different churches across the town of Irvine. Um, and I remember us praying uh, once in a sanctuary um, and the thing that happened is we were praying for revival. We were praying, God, send revival, start with me. And what a, an amazing prayer for young people to pray. We were in our late teens and our early 20s and we we're praying, God, break through. We know that we can't create revival, but help us to position ourselves for revival. What would that revival look like? It would look like ordinary believers sharing the gospel with passion. It would look like the fire of the Holy Spirit burning up all the chaff and all the dross in our lives to give us a singular focus on Jesus, giving us a fresh joy that infected everybody and brought salvation into our communities. I remember one day, Sam, uh, Sam mentioned this black flag. and uh, I remember once when the black flag was raised and that was when a bunch of Freemasons came in the door and said to us as we sat in that church praying for revival, what are you doing here? And we said, we're praying for, what are you doing here? collars and cuffs and you're like my goodness so let us pray this is this is what I want us to pray for just now and I wonder if we could just stand together just now and pray for revival pray that the Lord would remove anything that is an obstacle to him moving in our churches moving through the lives of our young people that nothing would be put no stumbling block would be put in the way of what God is wanting to do in our nation I believe that there is nothing can stop the Lord Almighty but I do sometimes think that we need to tend our hearts and we need to be very, very attentive to those things that are almost hindrances, like, like the, the boulders and the thistles and the weeds that, that, can, that can quench the seed out and stop believers actually engaging with the mission of God. So let's just pray for the next five minutes for, for revival, for the Holy Spirit to move in power and for every hindrance, for God even to identify, this was our prayer, Lord, expose anything in our lives in our churches or in our communities that are a hindrance to revival and who walk through the door. And you think there's surely an answer to prayer there. God is not shy in giving us the answer that we pray for. He wants to make a way where there seems to be no way. So let's, can I just, can we pray Korean style? Do you know one of the things that's come out of the turning is I'm hearing of over 40 pastors meeting in a local Costa at 7.30 every Thursday morning praying Korean style in Costa. Come on. Come on, don't you want to see that? Leaders praying for the fire of God to fall and everybody getting transformed by that. So let's pray. Let's just, let's just cry out, raise a voice to the Lord for revival.
Lord, we're praying for cultural transformation. We're praying for a paradigm shift in our churches. Even in our own thinking, Father God, would you take us and dislodge us from old patterns of thinking that would have us believe that it's all about a paid professional or it's all about getting people to church on a Sunday. Lord, help us to, let there be a kingdom movement where it's no longer about getting outsiders in, but about getting insiders out. God, help us to see not just bums on streets, but feet on bums on seats, but feet on the streets, Lord God. Let every ordinary believer be commissioned to go out in Jesus' name. Uh, the, the last thing I want us to pray just for the last five minutes um, of my time is, is for this up-and-coming uh, Leaders and Visioning Tour. Pray for the national team of the turning as we, as we seek to kind of just release this. Uh, we want, the vision here is for every city, every town, every region, every croft, village, highway and byway. It's not just about the big cities, even islands being, being reached with this move. We want this, we've got a three-year strategy to reach the whole of Scotland. Um, and and that, that's, going to ch that's going to change our churches. And it, and it demands that we change. It demands that we have a renewed, reformed way of thinking and particularly going out to the lost. So please pray, please pray. Let's pray for, can we put that slide up with just those five, five regions that are going to be coming up for, uh, for, for Dundee um, and then for East Cobride, for Ayrshire, which would be a regional wide hub uh, if that works out for Paisley and for Falkirk. So can we pray for these five cities? Also Inverness, Inverness who was part of the tour last year, they're wanting to launch a hub in Inverness that will kick off in August as well. And for the three existing cities as well, uh, Aberdeen, Glasgow, and Edinburgh, but particularly for these five cities. So let's just pray for them in this next, this next five minutes and then uh, we'll, we'll finish up and hand back. Uh, yeah, let's just pray in groups here, uh, twos and threes again, and then we'll, we'll close. You won't hear from me again. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity to share. I'm just gonna come and pray with someone, pass this mic back. So the Lord bless you.
Jesus, thank you again that there are even more people in your countries and your nations willing to serve. Amen. Okay, guys, we are going to have a quick five minutes. If you want to stretch your legs, jump to the toilet, continue praying, whatever you so desire. Um, and then after that, we will start again. So you have five minutes to do whatever you please. If that involves running away, please come back in five minutes, okay?
Okay, I'm always so shocked at how loud that is every time I talk. I need one of these for my home. I'm going to invite Crystal. Crystal is from 24-7 Prayer. And if there's a group of people to have at a National Prayer Day, it's got to be 24-7 Prayer, right? So, Crystal, I would love to hear more about who you are and what you do, if you don't mind. Okay. Well, well, well she's grabbing the mic, um, as she said, my name is Crystal, and I'm the National Coordinator for 24-7 Prayer in Scotland. Amazing. So what is your vision for Scotland when it comes to prayer? Um, well, what we say is 24-7 prayer. One of, one of our aims, kind of our vision statement, is to revive the church and we rewire culture. Because we believe that when we as God's kids meet with him in the place of prayer, um, we're changed first. Eugene Peterson said um, that a changed world begins with us and we change when we pray. Um, and so we believe that we change in that place of prayer. We get God's heart, his ideas, which are far better than our own. Um, and then that propels us out into our communities, the st our streets, the nations. Um, and then through that, um, culture is rewired because as we start reaching people with the message of Jesus and people encountering Jesus through us, um, then the poor and the marginalized are looked after, the lonely are welcomed in, the orphan is adopted, culture is rewired. So we say that, that um, through prayer and resourcing prayer, we want to revive the church and rewire culture. So I think my vision for Scotland is, is that, to see a church that is full of fire and alive and transforming their, na their own nation. That sounds like no mean feat, but it sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that's your job and not mine. That sounds great. Um, go for it. Okay, great. Um, so I just, I already said, I'm just setting a timer here because I'm a terrible judge of time. Um, and when I get talking about something I'm excited about, I could, we could be here the rest of the day. Um, so I already said a little bit about kind of our vision statement is 24-7 prayer. I think most of you guys probably are a little bit familiar with who 24-7 prayer is. Um, we've been around since 98 is when it, it started rather unexpectedly. Um, and today we're basically a relational network, tribe, family, of churches, missional communities, charities, NGOs across the globe um, that are seeking to make a measurable difference in the communities around them, um, are seeking to live lives of mission and justice, but prayer is, is at the heart and is what fuels everything that they do. Um, so we have um, communities that are involved that are doing things like helping young men and women get out of the street and gang culture in Manenberg, South Africa, to um, a, a church down in Kent um, that is uh, just doing stuff amongst the poor and the marginalized in their own community. So it's very different everywhere you go. Um, and I'm, I actually um, am not going to talk loads about who we are and what we do. One thing I did want to mention, since it's a day of prayer, is one of the things that we do is 24-7 is try and resource the church in prayer. And so one of those resources we just released, we're very excited about it, um, and it's an app for your phone um, to help you pray. We, we've taglined it, learn to pray by simply praying. Um, our phones can be one of our biggest distractions why not turn it into one of the biggest tools for prayer? Um, so it's called The Inner Room, and you can get it for Android or iPhone. Um, it's free, downloadable. Inner Room is what it's called, um, and it's great. You can set it to pray from anywhere from two minutes to an hour. Um, and it, there's like a, a, almost like a playlist, but it's a prayer list that you can create of all the things and people that are on your heart to pray for. Um, some of our other resources, aside from the obvious 
resourcing 24-7 prayer rooms, churches to pray 24-7. We also have a youth uh, prayer course. We have um, a prayer course for prisons, um, for prison chaplains to take their prisoners through. Um, That was basically birthed out of one of our leaders, Brian Heasley. His testimony, he came to faith in a prison cell. Um, and so he created this prayer, this resource. Um, and then we have a student pack for students that want to try doing um, prayer rooms on their campuses. Um, so that's all I'm really gonna say about who we are and what we do. If you wanna know more, find out how we can be an encouragement and resource um, to your church, your community. Um, give me a shout after. Um, But I just, I want to tell you a story that hopefully will inspire us in what we're trying to do here today. Um, And it's a story about a group of people that aren't very well known, but their reach throughout church history has been far-reaching and expansive. Um, They're a group of people simply known as the Moravians. Um, And in early 1700s, it would have been very dark and turbulent times in Europe. There was intense um, religious persecution um, and unrest across Europe. And there was this little band of refugees um, fleeing for their lives from what we would today know as the Czech and Slovakia. And... um, Around, the, around about the time that they reached what is today Poland, um, there was a German count named Zinzendorf. And Zinzendorf, as a young man, had vowed to God, um, along with some of his friends, um, to, to live a life that was true to Christ, kind to others, and loyal to taking the gospel to the nations. And he's a little bit older now. He's a wealthy count with an expansive estate. And he hears about these Moravian refugees. And because he's vowed to be kind to others, he invites them to come and live and settle in safety on his estate. So they do. And I think Zinzendorf went into it a little bit maybe naive, thinking, there are all these religious refugees. They're going to settle in on my estate. I'll build them a church, and we'll be this, this lovely little Christian community. Um, the thing was, this group of refugees were from different backgrounds. They were from different classes, different economic backgrounds, even different expressions of Christianity. Some were Protestant. Some were Catholic. And so even though they were all running for their lives for the same reason and being persecuted, now living in close quarters, they began to turn on each other um, and have a lot of disagreement. And um, it it wasn't exactly the Christian utopia that Zinzendorf had imagined. But because he had vowed to be true to Christ, he would not put up with it any longer, and and he began to challenge the Moravians um, to make the main thing the main thing, to make Jesus the the heart and center of their community, rather than getting caught up in all their disagreements. And in August of 1727, a dramatic move of the Holy Spirit happened in this little group of people which resulted in just major repentance and um and they began to learn how to love one another well and what it would what it looked like to be diverse in their culture their backgrounds um even some of their expressions of faith but to love and honor one another well And the result of that was this little village. Today, it is known as Herrnhut, Germany. Herrnhut means the watch of the Lord because what came out of this dramatic move of the Holy Spirit was 24-7 prayer nonstop for 100 years. 
their motto was, no one works unless someone is praying. Um, and the result of that was the greatest missions movement in the history of the church. And um, to give you an, uh, an understanding of how expansive their reach was, there was a group of, of Moravians on a ship bound for the new land of North America. And they were going as missionaries. And there were other Christians on that ship as well, also going as missionaries. And there was one young man in particular on that ship um, who was being sent out to North America to preach. His name was John Wesley. And at this point, John Wesley had a lot of questions about Christianity. He wasn't too sure he even believed God was real, but he had been told, well, go preach it until you believe it yourself. And he observed something on this ship. He observed that during the storms, this one group of Christians would be petrified when rations were low and they were having to conserve food and water. This one group of Christians were... Um, were selfish and would not share their rations with the rest of the ship. Whereas the Moravians would sing joyfully during the storms. They, when, it, when they had to ration, the Moravians would share what they had with everyone else with no thought for themselves. Um, and they just lived um, on that ship with such peace and love. And John Wesley had never seen anything like it. And it was when he went back to England after that trip um, that he began to look for the God that he saw in those Moravians. And he had that encounter where his famous words came from, my heart was strangely warmed. And he went on to be a great revival preacher. Um, one of my favorite stories um, that comes from the Moravians um, is when they first started sending missionaries. Um, this was all very new for them. This was at a time where missions was not something the church talked about a lot. It was all very new. And there were two young men from Hernhut who um, heard about these slaves that were being taken onto this island to work on a plantation, and their hearts were broken with the thought that these slaves would never know Jesus because they would never hear the gospel. So they went to the slave owners, and they, they said, can, can we come plant a church? And the slave owners were like, no, because it might mess with the work that we get out of the slaves. So no, you can't come. So after some prayer, they knew what they had to do. And they went back to the slave owners and they said, if we give ourselves to you as slaves, will you promise to not interfere when we share the gospel with our fellow slaves? And they said, sure. You know, these two young 20-something German farmers, they were like, yeah, we'll take you. You can preach anything you like. We don't care. So as they were getting on the, the boat, getting ready to head out, and all their friends and family were gathered to say goodbye to them, um, one of, as the, the boat was pulling away from the dock, one of the young men cried out what became kind of the battle cry of the Moravian church. He yelled, because worthy is the lamb who was slain, to receive the due and just reward of his suffering. And to me, what we're doing here today, all the stories you've heard of the stuff that um, is happening in Scotland, which is exciting, the stories that we're hearing of what God is doing through tribe praying, through tribe, through um, discipleship of our, our students, through the turning, it's so exciting. But it it's all for one thing, one person, because worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive the due and just reward of his suffering. 
which is relationship with us. Um, and to me, that's the purpose of prayer. That's why we do it, is because prayer gives us intimate relationship with God, which is what Jesus died for, so he's worthy of it. That's why we do mission. That's why we try and live lives of justice, um, because it's what Jesus died for, and he's worthy of it. Um, and so I thought it was interesting that James um, already had us pray um, for unity because that was kind of the thing that I came today with in my heart. Um, you know, the, the Moravians, they, um, after that great move of, of the Spirit, they were still from diverse backgrounds. They still had diverse beliefs. They still um, were different people from different cultures. But they lived according to a motto that Zinzendorf had set for them, which was, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, love. Um, and I think right now we're, we're living in a time where there's so much division in our nation. Um, political, religious, otherwise there's so much division. And Jesus said that people would know the Father by how we love one another. There's never been a more important time for the church um, to show unity and love, even in our diversity. So we're going to take some time right now. We're going to end, kind of end this prayer time with praying um, for the church in Scotland um, to bear the mark of the Father because of how well we love and honor one another. Um, so um, I know it's the end of the day. We're tired. You guys have done well. Um, but I'm going to get us to stand up. Um, and let's get, let's get active in this. Um, <laughs> I, I'd said to Des, when Des asked me, oh, what slot do you want in the day? I was like, oh, it's fine. Just give me whichever one. So he gives me the end of the day. Thank you, Des. <laughs> um, so let's stand up. And um, I'm going to have you guys get into groups of four. And then I'm going to tell you in your groups of four what you're going to pray for. So get in your groups of four. Okay, are we in our groups of four? So in your groups of four, you are going to decide who's going to be A, B, C, D. Okay, do we know A, B, C, D? You know who you are? All right, A's. This is what you're going to pray for in your group. You're going to pray for an increase and an expansion of the church coming together in prayer and unity. We are seeing this grow just in the past few years across the globe, but Scotland specifically, we are seeing the church being hungry, not just to pray, but to come together in prayer across denominations. And I'm sure that everyone here has heard the famous Jean Darnell prophecy of fire coming from the north. And she recently passed away. And I, my question, the day I heard she passed away, my question was, God, when are you going to fulfill the word to your servant? You gave her that word. We've all been standing on it, believing. When are you going to fulfill it? She's dead now. Like, I don't want the rest of us to die before we see the fulfillment of that word. Um, but something about fire is that if fire is going to spread, it has to connect. 
Um, and I don't know if you guys have, have seen Lord of the Rings, but there's a bit in Lord of the Rings where they light the beacons, and it's their way of communicating to one another um, that it's time to rally together. And so, A's, you're going to pray that the church lights the beacon, they communicate, and we start to rally together in prayer. B's, um, you are going to pray for any area where there's still some distance, coolness, even animosity amongst Protestant and Catholics, that there would be unity between the Protestant and the Catholic in our nation again, that all the hurt and the pain that has been caused by both sides over the generations would be made whole, that there would be wholeness and healing, and we would be one church again. Um, C's, you are going to pray for um, denominational leaders, local church leaders, organizational and charity leaders. Sometimes as leaders, we feel this need to protect the people that we're leading, and that causes us sometimes even un unintentionally to become territorial. Um, and so pray for leaders, for wisdom, to know how to, to steward what God has given them, but still run hard after unity. Um, and then D's, um, you're going to pray that we as the Scottish church would be a voice of love and peace in the midst of all the Brexit turmoil. So um, I know I'm asking you guys to pray for some controversial things, but if the church isn't right in the middle of the controversy bringing love and peace, then uh, yeah. That's where we need to be. So um, go to it. However you want to do it.
If you want to just start to wrap up those prayers, we're going to pray for one last thing all together before I hand it back over to the worship team. Okay. So we're just going to pray for one last thing all together. I'm going to kind of take liberties here, but I felt like since we're in Dundee, should happen. I, I didn't warn David and Sarah ahead of time that I was going to do this, but David and Sarah are kind of leading um, leading the way in uh, a house of prayer here in Dundee. And um, I know there's a number of churches across the city that are involved in that. I know Bob's been involved. And, and so I just... Um, Something that, that is 24-7 we are seeing happen in the world right now is um, any time the church has gone through crisis, there's been this, this move of kind of the contemplative, monastic um, type, type that has come along to help undergird and strengthen the church and call her back to her first love. And so something that we're, we're seeing across the globe right now are these kind of houses of prayer popping up that is providing a place of common ground for the church in the city to come together and remember who their first love is, remember um, who it is that should be fueling all the stuff they're doing. Um, and so um, Dundee is our first official established house of prayer in Scotland, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and, um, and so I just thought, could we just all, while we're standing, um, gather around David and Sarah. So Sarah, you're going to need to come out and join David here. Um, just get, get around them and let's just, for the sake of time, let's just pray Korean style over them um, and just pray over them. They've made some incredible, they won't tell you, but they've made some incredible sacrifices to do what they're doing because they so believe um, in it and they know this is what God has called them to for this time. Um, and so can we just pray over them as a couple, um, but then also just over the house of prayer and what God is doing in prayer and unity in Dundee. It, it's unusual. Um, he is doing something special in this city. And so let's pray for that. So let's just gather around them, pray Korean style for just one minute, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So, Father, we thank you for what you are doing in this city. Yes, God, we hear the negative news all the time, but, God, we also see what you are doing, that you are raising up a house of prayer um, in this city, a house of prayer in individuals and a house of prayer in your, your church, your citywide church. Um, and, God, we say yes and amen to what you are doing God, and we ask that you would continue to establish your kingdom in Dundee, that you would continue um, for your will to be done in this city as it is in heaven. Um, and so, yeah, God, we just, we bless what you're doing. We bless the house of prayer. 
We bless the churches of this city that are choosing to come together in unity. Um, and we ask for more, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you guys have any words for these guys, feel free to, to share them. Um, but I'm just going to hand it over to the worship team and to Kirsty. Thanks, Crystal. Um, we're just going to take some time. Um, if you want to share words, images, please do. Please take that as well. Um, but we're going to take some time. We have prayed for so many different things today, for different denominations, for different generations. For But we've prayed for our nation as a whole. Um, and so we want to take some time um, as the worship band help us to close today. That if there's something in particular that's really sitting in your mind, even if that's the thing you've spoken about, that's cool because that's that's how I, that's how I think. But if there's something that has really, really sparked your mind, I want you to really pray into that, to thank God that that's because that's in your heart and that's in your mind for a reason. God's placing that in your heart and your mind for a reason. So take some time to pray into that. Worship if you want to worship. You can sing you can dance you can get on your knees but just thank god for the incredible incredible gift that he's given us here we have been able to gather freely to pray for a nation there are so many countries in this world that could not do that and that blows my mind so whatever god's placed on your heart today whatever you've really really remembered please just take some time to think about that Think about what you could do in your context to help aid those situations, to change those situations, to make this nation a nation for God. So I'm just going to invite the worship team, the worship band, to start up. Please feel free to worship, to pray, to thank God as you please.
Your beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a powerful name Nothing compares to this What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus Cause death could not hold you The veil tore before you You silenced the past of sin Jesus, thank you that we as a nation can come and worship you. Thank you that we as a people, as members of the kingdom of God can come. We've taken so much time today to pray, to ask God for things. So for this last seven minutes, to be exact, five, ten minutes or so, let's just take time to worship him. Because even regardless of what we ask, whether it is the most ridiculous thing or whether it is the simplest thing, he still loves us and he's still willing to try and make us as happy as possible. So let's just take some time to thank him for that. Take some time to worship him. And take some time to thank the incredible worship band as well and their willingness to come and help us out with that. So thank you guys. But let's just wrap today up worshiping him for the incredible God that he is. Satisfies only you, Lord. You are my best thought by day. 
you by night Waking or sleeping Your presence, my life You are my wisdom You are my true word I am Let's finish today by singing of God's amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. Grace that's on my heart 
let's just finish by singing that verse 4. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise. And when we first begun. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for coming here, whether you have traveled just down the road, whether this is where you normally are, or whether you've traveled across the country. We have had such a joy having you here and being able to pray for our country with you guys as well. Yeah, we want to say thank you to um, David and Logie St. John's for, for hosting us um, yes. again. Yes. And one more thank you to the band, absolutely marvelous. And thank you for praying. You've made a difference today. God bless. <laughs>